Hello, this is Dr. David Kreller of the Chemistry Department of Georgia Southern University. This is my first video in a series of videos about chemical thermodynamics. And in this first video, I'm going to talk about entropy, this magical, mysterious state function. And I'll show you how to do some simple calculations with entropy, specifically for a phase change. We'll start off with talking about what maybe you already know something about, the concept of energy in the universe. Although, you know, chemical thermodynamics may seem like a new subject for you, all the concepts in chemical thermodynamics build on what you already know. So it's great if you already know something about the variable energy, and you know that if you want to understand phenomena in the universe, if you want to understand the way things work, it's really helpful to know something about energy. And when you're using concepts of energy to interpret things that go on in the universe, you, know, you will definitely be aware that energy is conserved. The amount of energy is constant. It only moves around and sometimes changes form, but energy is neither created nor destroyed. Okay, so you can see in some phenomena, sort of in terms of energy changing forms, you can see potential energy changing to kinetic energy. Energy is not being destroyed, it's only changing form shape-shifting kind of a crazy stuff. So the law of energy conservation is very useful. And it tells us which processes are possible. For example, you can't um, expect to be at the top of a, a, like a 10 foot high hill on your bicycle and uh, to end up going you know a million miles an hour by the time you get to the bottom of the hill. Sure you'll pick up some speed as your potential energy turns into kinetic but you'll only pick up so much speed. The law of conservation of energy is very useful to t in terms of telling us what is possible. But that concept of energy, as useful as it is, is not sufficient to understand what's called spontaneity. This term, spontaneity, basically we'll use when we're talking about processes or phenomena or changes, however you want to say it, um, that happen automatically. You know, they'll just happen without us having to intervene in them. Okay, so lots of processes just really go only in a certain direction. And I'll use a few examples here to illustrate this idea. Okay, we have a gas. The gas is initially confined to one side of a container. And then we open up the stopcock. Well, the gas spontaneously spreads out and fills both sides of the container equally. All right? But it's not spontaneous for the reverse process to happen. So that's an example. Spontaneous process. Another spontaneous process might be a chemical reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to form the product water or H2O. That happens spontaneously. You know, it might take a little one of the NASA engineers might have to get out there underneath this the um space shuttle with a little big light or something like that to get the process started but once it's started it certainly happens spontaneously and you don't see water molecules spontaneously reverting back to oxygen and hydrogen molecules so it's really spontaneous again just in one direction another example might be say the rusting of a nail you know, you probably have seen this happen. You set out a nail, exposed to the elements, the moisture, perhaps salt, such as in rusting, and oxygen in the atmosphere. And just in a little while, you get you know, a rusty nail, the formation of iron oxide. Okay, so it's spontaneous for a nice, clean, shiny nail to rust into a dirty, tarnished, or a rusty nail. Okay, it's not spontaneous to go the reverse reaction. We need the concept of entropy to help us understand what processes are spontaneous, what processes are not. And so this uh, new state function was invented when the first sort of engineers and scientists took a real close look at how engines worked. They found they needed this uh, variable which they called entropy. It was understood then that the only processes or phenomena in nature that are spontaneous are those processes that lead to an increase in this entropy of the universe. 
So this is different now from energy because you know energy of the universe is a constant. It's always the same. But this, you know, entropy in contrast is something that does change. It's always actually increasing in spontaneous processes. And so it's a state function. And so a state function, you could just calculate the change in that state function as some process occurs, basically as the value of that state function for the f in the final state minus the value in the initial state. And being a state function, it doesn't really matter how you went from the initial state to the final state. It only matter the, you know, this difference, the delta s, only depends upon the final and initial states. So basically what we've just said here in words is um, what is referred to as the second law of thermodynamics. You might say, second law of thermodynamics, what are we doing starting at the second law of thermodynamics? What happened to the first law of thermodynamics? Well, the first law of thermodynamics was the energy conservation law. Entropy is something that has a numerical value. To calculate the change in entropy is actually relatively straightforward for what are referred to as isothermal processes. And those are processes that occur at, and so the entropy change for an object or system in an isothermal process is just equal to the heat flow divided by the temperature. In this world, in this universe, we generally don't have individual objects undergoing changes all by themselves. You know, as you've learned in th thermodynamics already, you know that we usually break the universe down into a system and its surroundings. And thermodynamics, we have to consider both. So to find the entropy change the overall entropy change, entropy change for the universe, we have to calculate entropy changes individually for the system and for the surroundings and add them together. So let's look at water changing phase, going from the solid phase to the liquid phase, or liquid phase to the solid phase. The conservation of energy tells us that, well, to go from solid water to liquid water, heat has to go into the water right or you could say this is endothermic the process of going from solid water to liquid water is spontaneous the temperature is above the freezing point of water but this reverse process is uh, spontaneous you spontaneously go from liquid water to solid water when the temperature of the surroundings is uh, less than uh, the freezing point for water the first law of thermodynamics energy conservation law can't help us understand the spontaneity so let's calculate the overall change in entropy for the universe when one mole of solid water, which is at 273 Kelvin, melts in your hand, which is at 310 Kelvin. The overall entropy change for the universe has to be calculated as the sum, the individual entropy changes for the ice and for the hand. This isothermal process, big thing to keep track of is the heat that flows. And here we have heat flowing from the hand to the ice. You know, if you've held ice in your hand, you know that your hand is losing heat. So its Q value is negative, right? So its entropy change is going to be negative. Ice, however, conversely, is absorbing heat. Its Q value is going to be positive. And so it's going to experience an increase in entropy. We'll calculate the overall entropy change of the universe by okay, individually calculating change in entropy for the ice and for the hand. So 6.01 kilojoules of, of uh, heat has to flow if we're going to melt a mole of ice. So we'll just take this value. Okay, so delta S for the ice is 6.01 kilojoules divided by the temperature of the ice, 273 Kelvin. Okay, and that turns out to be 22 joules per Kelvin. You know, I switched from kilojoules to joules in this calculation. It's kind of not shown here, but I did that. And similar calculation would be done for to find the change in entropy for the hand. Okay, so it loses the heat, so it's got a negative sign, negative 6.01 kilojoules divided by its temperature, which is 310 Kelvin. Okay, it's 2.6 joules per Kelvin. So that is definitely a spontaneous process, and that should come as no surprise to you. You know already that if you hold ice in your hand, your hand is obviously warmer than the ice. Well, the ice is going to melt 
spontaneously. You already knew that, but now you can do a calculation to back that observation up 